Okay, we'll get started. So um, welcome to this webinar series. This is on um, a portfolio series, which focuses on getting you from medical student stage through your foundation years to potentially applying for core training um, for surgical training, if that's what you fancy. Um, so this is a three part series and it will be for the next three Wednesdays in October. So this week, next week and the following week. Um, and to start for the first lecture, we're going to aim this at medical students um, and how to get through to your foundation training. Um, so today our speakers are Kate and Lois, um, so they are two of our NSTS committee members um, who have just gone through this exact process that they're going to tell you about, so um, they're both FY1s at the moment, um, and so they've taken busy time out of their first brand new jobs um, to take you back through the process, um, and so without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to them. Um, Okay, so hi guys. Um, I hope you can hear me okay um, and also see me. I'm just going to check in the chat if you can. Can someone just say if you can hear me okay? Or oh, Jen? Yep, can hear you perfectly. So great. So we're aiming this mainly at kind of clinical medical students and we're going to cover a few different things. Um, we're going to cover general applications in um, final year, which Obviously, a lot of you have already been through this year, but we'll mention it a little bit for the people in year four and year five, just to give them a bit of a background. Um, and then we'll go into a bit more specifics on tips for final year students coming up to some of those big exams like the SJT um, and the PSA. Um, and then also for final years, we'll be covering some advice on how to choose deaneries and jobs, um, specifically mentioning what will be useful for a career in surgery. Um, and then the like kind of the second half will be mainly about getting started on your portfolio, introducing you to the self-assessment um, CST uh, app, um, guidance online and what things you can be doing quite easily as a medical student to get yourself like on the tracks um, to getting the highest marks later on. The portfolio section will be focused more around getting started and what it is and just some general general advice. But our third lecture, which is on the CST application itself will kind of cover more of the getting the highest, highest marks if you already know exactly what's going on and you just want to get those last last few marks and also the CST interview. So for those of you who are, um, you know, already on top of the portfolio side of things, um, you can also like stay for the first half and then focus on our third lecture for the rest of it. Um, and then at the end, yeah, any questions you guys have just about the application process in general um, or anything to do with um, medical students to FY1, let us know at the end. Um, yeah. So hi, I'm Lois. Um, I'll just quickly run through here of how um, everything works. So either you'll be in fifth year now and you'll be doing this, which is up on the screen, or you'll be younger and you can have a little look and see this is kind of how final year works um, and just the order everything happens in. So I was lucky I had my finals in fourth year. So I got into fifth year, didn't have to think about really medicine as much. Um, and I could just like focus on ranking jobs and thinking about what I want to do. In F1, however, if you're revising, then unfortunately, probably till January, I think you'll be busy with that. Um, so deanery rankings, and um, this happens about September time now. So you have to think probably before final year, where do you want to go? Um, so that's we'll talk through all the things you think about whenever you make those decisions and how you can influence and get certain jobs and things like that. Um, next, so sorry, back to the jobs. When you apply. You applied a foundation program but they've changed it now that you now can apply for this SFP so it used to be called AFP called academic foundation program it's now called SFP which is specialized foundation program so you can apply for that at the same time as foundation program and you can also apply for a thing called foundation priority program which I hadn't really heard of before fifth year to be honest and um, but it's basically just a program that you can apply for um, and it's in sort of places that people don't always want to go to. It might be a bit more like rural, like the Lake District or something. Um, and when you go, they offer you something, you know, to kind of like an incentive for going. So either you can do like some leadership and um, training or I think there's one that for business as well. And um, so there's like other bits and bobs, some offer money um, to go to a really rural place. But it's just interesting just to know that those exist, if that's something that you're interested in. Um, so after you've applied, 
the SFP is quite competitive and um, so they usually will have interviews so they'll send those out after you've applied and um, but we've got a slide later on and more detail on that program. Then you have your SJT so it's either in December or January you can choose when you do it. Um, I personally did mine before Christmas just because I wanted to not be revising or doing any work over Christmas so and that's just personal choice. Um, and you've got your PSA, there's two sittings for that as well. I did mine in May and um, we've got a slide on that later too. Um, and then you will hear about your job rankings in about March and you then will hear where you've got into, what school, what dinner you've got into and then you rank all these jobs which we will talk about later as well. And during all of this time you should also be doing your portfolio doing a bit of research, which you will touch on later and what things are the most useful to do to make your time the most effective. Okay, we'll go on the next slide. Um, so the actual application process, um, this is just um, just give you an overview of, in case you're not aware um, of how it works. So it's a program system called Oriel, so kind of like UCAS, but the medicine version for F1. Um, but you also will use Oriel further on when you apply for other um, medical training programs that later on down the line. Um, this is national, so everybody who graduates um, will use this. Mm -hmm. And you, as I said, you have to choose before September where you want to go. You have to rank them all, even if you really don't want to go to somewhere, just put up, you know, obviously last. Um, because just in case you didn't get your first choice, then your second, third and fourth ones, I would say are quite important that, you know, they're places that you would actually consider going <laughs> to live for two years. OK, and um, so after you've ranked them, then everybody in the whole of the UK is compared based on how you've done a medical school and um, your SJT and then other bits and bobs, which we'll touch on in a wee minute. We've got slides in those and um, important to mention from this year. Um, it used to be October you had to apply for, so it's now September, so you really need to have thought before you come into fifth year um, what you're doing, because I've got a housemate who's in Liverpool and she didn't realise that the AFP or the SFP you apply for at the same time. So on the morning of the application day, she was typing all these like forms, trying to fill them in, you know, rapidly because she didn't realise. So just to be aware of, um, it's all at the same time. And pre-allocation um, to foundation school. So this, if you um, have parental responsibilities or um, you've got like a medical condition that needs following up, there's certain criteria um, on the foundation program website that you can apply for. And if you get approved, they will pre-allocate you um, based on your individual circumstances. Okay. Um, so yes, as I was saying, it's based on two things you'll get a score out of 100 points at the end of it all and um, so either your medical school is up to 50 marks um, and then 50 by your SJT so it's quite scary that you can work for five years and um, to get your educational score and then SJT is your other half and that's just a one test one time one day and it's actually quite big and so we'll touch on the SJT later and um, so up to 43 points um, for your educational score 43 would be if you're in the first decile um, and obviously 34 if you're in the last decile in medical school so they should give you provisional deciles I think before fifth year so that you have an idea of where you're sitting in the year and then what you know approximate score you'll get then up to seven points for additional things if you've done a previous degree if you have come in as a postgrad entry to medicine that can be really good um, if you've intercalated, you can get points for that. Um, so those are all useful things. If you haven't done those, don't worry. I didn't do those myself. I just went straight through. Um, I was like, I just want to be a doctor as soon as I can. So um, you also can end up with good jobs and, you know, it's not the end of the world. So don't worry about that. Um, publications. Now, this is really important because I sort of realised halfway through medical school, oh, I have to get publications, you know, to get points. Um, but if you haven't, gone through the process and it's got to completion and um, you have to have this PubMed ID you have to it has to have got to the final stages by the time you apply for this to count so even if you have research in the in the works and it's kind of on its way to becoming um, published if it's not done by the deadline it will not 
um, count. So don't worry if you haven't, because I didn't either mind still being manuscripted and being processed from my fourth year research. Um, but it's just be aware of, if, especially if you're third or fourth year and you're listening to this, then just to crack on with that if you want to try and get those extra points um, ahead of final year. Um, and then yes, the SJT, we'll touch on it later, um, but it's your second half of the points. Okay, so yes, the SFP, previously called AFP. This is really good as it's another chance to do things outside of medicine that will really contribute to your CV. So you can get involved in research. You could spend time doing a project um, on this program and then get your publication that you maybe didn't get in medical school. You might then get it during this. Um, you can also try out leadership roles, which is which we'll, I'll touch on later. Um, that's quite an important thing to have for future CST applications. Um, so you could spend this time doing that um, and getting those points kind of early on, which is really good. Um, you also can test out medical education in these programmes um, and really practice teaching and getting involved in that. Um, so everything is very, very relevant for future CV and just maximising what you're doing in your time. Um, with SFP, the rotations, you'll obviously do some in the hospital, but you'll have one four month where you'll be focusing on one of these three things. So it's just interesting to be aware of that you might not be in the hospital on the ward um, for some of your rotations during this programme. Um, but if you don't really like patients or talk to people, then this would be perfect because <laughs> you can avoid all the nonsense um, on the ward. So um, you can apply for a maximum of two schools for this. As I said, it's a bigger application form than the regular foundation programme. Um, it has white space questions that will ask you, you know, what are your general goals? Um, how do you work in a team? All those sorts of like classic interview questions you have to sort of write out a big answer. Um, and they like it as well if you've had previous achievements, whether they're academic um, or outside, then those you usually put those on as well and talk about those. Um, and because it's quite competitive, they will then shortlist people, interview you, but the individual schools will contact you whatever certain way they do it. Um, I personally didn't apply for this um, at the time, but I know Jen did, so if she wants to jump in, she can add a wee bit if she wants to. Um, but basically, it's really important to know that you'll hear back from SFP before you hear back from foundation programmes. So if you've got an offer, they'll let you know before March. And if you accept that offer, then you're no longer part of the foundation programme. So it's quite important that you are really obviously keen to do it because once you accept then, and that's what you'll end up be doing. Okay. Great, thanks Lois. Um, just a quick mention on the, this, oh, can't go backwards. Um, anyway, just a quick mention on the EPM um, from a minute ago about those educational achievement points. Um, there's just been a couple of comments in the chat which are correct. The, this is the final year, I think, that publications and additional degrees count. After that, they won't count anymore. Um, it's meant to be making sure it's, things are more inclusive because obviously additional degrees cost a lot of money and you don't want to encourage people just to do an additional degree because they have the money to afford it, et cetera, et cetera. Lots of other thing, reasons why, but that's not actually going to count after. I think it's next year or the year after, but um, that's just something to be aware of if you're coming in from a year four or year, like first clinical year perspective, um, that publications won't count then and, and degrees won't count then, but they still count later on. So it's still worth considering intercalating if you, if you can and you want to, because they'll count for CST and they'll count later on. So that's, here we go, UK AFP from 2023 onwards. Um, okay. So anyway, moving on to the SJT, which as Lois has mentioned, it is 50% of where you end up going. So it's a huge exam. And as she mentioned, you work five years um, on medicine, plus or minus an extra year for intercalation. And that counts for as much as a two hour, 20 minute exam does. So my overall advice is do not neglect it. I've known people who have been top decile and then not done very well in the SJT and fallen out of their preferred deanery. But I've also known the complete reverse happen and people absolutely smash the SJT and pull themselves up from below average decile. So 100% don't neglect it. Um, 
Just for people who don't know, the SJT is the Situational Judgment Test, and it's not an assessment of clinical knowledge. It's an assessment of um, what is the most appropriate thing and being to do in a situation and being a good doctor. So, for example, the question might be, a patient who doesn't speak English comes into A&E, you're not sure how unwell they are, um, but you can't understand what they're saying, rank these options of what to do from the most appropriate to the least appropriate, and it will be, you know, ask their relative to, to translate for you, to, um, swap with a colleague who speaks the language because they might be able to get more information out than you, wait for a translator to arrive, um, I don't know, use sign language to communicate, um, and then they'll have another one, and you just rank them um, worst to best, um, and so obviously, you know, sign language is obviously at the bottom, and then usually there's one or two really clear obvious ones but then the middle ones are kind of sometimes it's very up for interpretation so a lot of the time there's no right answer it's just what's the most appropriate um so it's worthwhile kind of getting your head around what what they want you to say rather than what you necessarily think is right because you might think that i oh, swapping with a colleague who can speak the language seems like the obvious option because in a real life scenario because they know the language that they will be easily able to do that and that's what happens generally in the day-to-day -day nhs but what they'll actually probably want the right answer to be is get a translator because that's a proven like so you need to know what the right answer they want is rather than what will necessarily always clinically happen and the more practice you do the more you'll realize what is what is the answer they want you to say um, so this test is done on a, is a computer based test now it used to be on paper, um, but it is done at like test centers so for example where you do the driving theory tests, you do it there in those Pearson view centers, you can also do it at home. I've heard some horror stories of people doing it at home, so I would personally advise avoiding home if you can. I've heard of people having like writing on a piece of paper um, and getting disqualified because of it and having to go through a whole process later on about proving that they weren't actually cheating. When you're allowed to have a paper in the computer-based center, in the test center. So I think if you can, it's safer to be at a test center because it's all under kind of vigilated control settings and it takes away a stress of, am I doing anything wrong? Or will I be disqualified for turning around and making it look like someone else is in the room or something? So I would probably just say it kept my mind at, um, at ease for doing it in a test center. So that, like Laura said, two windows in December and January. I also did it before December, before Christmas because I wanted to just get it out the way, um, but it doesn't matter when you do it. It's um, 70 questions, so it's really time pressured. So I would say definitely you have to make sure you answer everything because even if you get the, the entire, the wrong order of some questions, you still get five marks. Whereas if you write nothing, you get zero. So if you don't answer every question, you're shooting yourself in the foot because every mark counts in the SJT. Um, major resources to use. There's a lot of like debate over whether or not you should not revise very much because it, it won't help or don't revise using too many resources because it's conflicting evidence. I found, and from my and from like the friends, the friendship group I had at uni, we found the more you could do, the better you did. And obviously it's a plateau. You get to a point where you are saturated with knowledge, but it's just getting into the mindset of the SJT. It's getting into the mindset of what do they want you to say? And so I found that using like, a, like as many, well, just practicing as much and as much as you can, you ended up doing better because you just get into that mindset. So things that I would say to use are the practice paper online. They the, use the paper ones, even though they've changed it now. There's There used to be only two sets of questions, ranking questions and best of choosing best of three, but now they've included another, another type of question. And so even though the old past papers won't be exactly right, do them all, anything you can get your hands on, do them twice, do them now, and then do them before you do the exam. You won't remember the questions because they're very, they're very wishy-washy questions and the, the questions themes repeat themselves. So you won't remember them if you do them twice. So do everything you can twice, revise as much as you can for it, get books if you want. Um, good medical practice is where they base their knowledge on. Some people swear by reading it. I personally didn't, but 
because it's a long document. Um, but some people would choose to do that. And so I think just practice, practice, practice. Other people also do courses. There's MDU do a course, eMedica does a course uh, around, I think they're both around kind of 80 pounds-ish. Um, but then there also, if you look on Facebook, there are some free ones advertised, just day, day courses. So if you just keep an eye on that, I would recommend probably doing as much, if, if you can, do as much as you can, because the SJT is 50% of where you end up. So yeah, don't neglect it is the, is the overarching advice for that. Um, and then moving on to the PSA, which is kind of less pressure on this because you only have to pass it. It doesn't matter if you pass it with 100% or if you just pass it with the pass mark. So less pressure, but I would also say don't neglect this exam either because it's probably the most clinically relevant exam you will do. You'll find that a lot of the things that come up in it, you will have a similar experience of during your kind of foundation years. Um, so the prescribing safety assessment or as one of my friends used to call it the prescribing dangerously assessment um, is a two hour exam um, of 200 marks and there are eight sec sections. So I've written them down here. Um, and again, it's a really, really time pressured exam. So you want to get through everything because some marks are really easy, quick marks that you'll just know, but the majority of the questions are involve you having to look in the BNF. So for those of you who don't know, the BNF is your Bible of, um, all things, drugs, roots, doses, everything. What is the best thing for this condition? The BNF will become your best friend. You will have to get familiar with it because the question might be something like, so for adverse drug reactions, it'll be like, which of these drugs, and they'll list six drugs, is most likely to cause this side effect. And you will never know all of them. You'll never learn enough drugs to know every reaction of everything. So you just have to, figure out how to use the BNF in an appropriate way to quickly search for that side effect in each of those drug, um, in, those, in, in those drugs that are mentioned. So the BNF is just gonna become your best friend. Um, prescribing is very classic questions, just here's a synopsis, prescribe a dose, prescribe fluid for this patient who's no by mouth. And you'll get marks for choosing the right type of fluid. You'll get marks for dose, root, frequency. There's 40% of the marks are in the prescribing questions. So it's worthwhile spending 40% of the time on those questions because um, like they're there, like, I don't know, because obviously it's 40%. And then prescription review is 16%. So prescription review will be, here's a patient's drug chart. What is wrong with it? And you might, it might be someone's got a dosing error and being prescribed paracetamol of like, for like five times the normal dose, that like toxic dose. And you just have to, you have to identify what are the things that are wrong. Um, planning management, providing information is like, oh, this patient's on the pill. Um, what should you do if you missed a dose? Calculation skills, uh, for example, the, the patient's on this opioid, what should it be if they're on this different opioid? So opioid conversions. So again, that's a, classic scenario where you need to know where to find things in the BNF because opioid conversions are something you're never going to learn off by heart either. But if you go on to palliative care summary on, um, on the BNF, first drug reactions, drug monitoring and data interpretation. Um, this exam, again, like I say, it's just passing, but it's worthwhile taking seriously because it's going to be really useful. The major things that I use, which I found useful was this YouTube um, video which I think it's one of the first ones that comes up if you type in prescribing safety assessment, but I will send the link and send the slides for you guys to see it. And it's just a guy who goes through all the different sections and then he gives you a PDF afterwards of all the kind of top tips, the key places to, to note down where you find things in the BNF, things like that. It's a really useful YouTube video. Pass the PSA book is this book, which a lot of my friends use, which gives a lot of information, um, before giving a lot of practice questions. So it's worthwhile doing. And the online past papers are the things to do as, men, like as many times as you can as well. Practicing the um, timing element of it is really important because you can easily get caught up in these first few sections and then not get it down to these sections, which are actually quick, easy marks. So you want to prioritize where the bulk of the marks is, but you don't want to lose those really easy marks as well. But yeah, practice, practice, practice. BNF is your best friend. Oops. 
oops, I'm clicking on the, I clicked on the YouTube video. Sorry guys, let me go back. <laughs> I can actually show you that. Where did it go? Here we go. Okay, so now coming on to Oriel rankings, which is going to be way more useful for those in final year or those have just applied. Um, and we can, if you have any more questions, just kind of chuck them in the chat as we go, or we'll just look at them at the end. Key questions I'm going to cover are how do you know which deanery to go to, or how should you decide? How should you rank jobs, specifically if you're looking at doing a surgical career later on? Does it matter what you start on? Does it matter if you don't get a surgical job? Are there any specialties that are better than others? Um, should you do ITU, for example, instead of a medical job? And would it be better to be in a DGH or a teaching hospital? So in terms of deanery rankings, I'm gonna get Lois as well input here because we both are in different deaneries. So I'm in Northwest London and Lois is in the uh, Yorkshire Humber deanery. So as she mentioned, you've got all these different deaneries here and you have to rank them all. So you rank the ones which you want best first and then work your way down. I would say that a lot of people I've spoken to who, it, who are in the year below have said that they didn't want to put something, a competitive deanery first because they didn't think they'd get it. But, and like, you don't want to be on just the edge and fall on, or, or instead of falling out into the top of the next deanery. I personally think that because the SAT is such a lottery, put where you want to go first, because it, you might end up doing really well in the SAT. You might end up choosing the deanery below and being right at the top and thinking, God damn it, I could have been really high up in my first choice. You might end up being at the bottom of your second deanery. And so I think put where you want to go first is the major thing. Don't be tactical about it. Just apply where you want to go apply like I personally applied a lot of about where my friends went because it's a big adjustment moving into F1 you're changing places or some people most people will be changing locations or at least hospitals um, you're starting a new job it's very full-on you lose so much time you realize that as a medical student you had all the time in the world and now you suddenly have none um, and it's nice to have something familiar about it so going with friends and where you can just be like oh god this happened to me today it's really nice, I think, having some friends there, but other people will prioritize where your family are, or if you've got, you know, where your family are, you might be able to save money from renting with them. So it's all about personal preference, but just my major advice would be choose where you want to go best first. Um, and I'll talk about London in a second, but Lois, if you want to just drop in your little piece about Yorkshire and Humber. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I fully agree with Kate. I went with two friends from Liverpool where I studied. And I am so glad that I did that because it is so nice to come back from work and just know somebody and have a chat because I kind of went thinking, oh, I'm going to really socialise and work and see everyone all the time. But some days at work, you will find that you just stay in the ward all day and it's actually quite hard to meet F1s unless you're very like social outside of work and at the weekends and things. So um, if you're somebody that does like to have people that you know near you, I would recommend going with friends. Um, so I am in Yorkshire, so it's different than other ones because you apply to the whole of Yorkshire, which is massive. It's number, where is the map? 19, the big one. Um, and then you hear back on the results day, I think in March, that, okay, you've got into Yorkshire, happy days. Then you have to re-rank it again. So you then rank northwest and south so Leeds is where I put which is west and um, Sheffield south and then like Hull and things are north um so it's just useful to be aware of that and then we heard back like a couple of weeks later after that oh you've got into west or you've got into wherever you're going and then you have to rank all the jobs and for Yorkshire there was I think over 200 jobs we had to rank um so that's also a good thing to be aware of because some deaneries I think like Liverpool so it's like northwest um, there should be like some people had 20 jobs to rank which was nothing um, whereas here's me going through 200 jobs and I think right what do I want to do with two years um, so yes just useful to be aware how each different foundation school is quite different and how everything's done. Yeah I would agree as well um, in terms of London to note that North um, West and North Central and East London have merged this year um, and there is a chat about I think now South Thames has changed how they do it as well. So it's no longer London, Links 1, Links 2, Links 3, Coast and County. It's now Northwest London, oh, sorry, Southwest London, South East London, and then West, North and South 
Kent Surrey and Sussex. So I believe they're transitioning into having just one London deanery, including North London and South London, and then Kent Surrey and Sussex is separate. So depending on what, you're, what year you're in, just keep track of the updates because it might um, influence where you choose to go. Um, yeah, so, but every deanery is different. Scotland, as you can see, is absolutely ginormous and I am not best placed to tell you how it works with them, but I assume they have a two-stage application process where you kind of get in and just like Lois said about Yorkshire, you choose a sec second area and then, then you choose your jobs after that. Um, so yeah, just worth thinking about, but yes, don't, yeah, put where you want to go first, first. In terms of job ranking advice, um, I've got some general advice and then just some things to think about. So even if you want to do surgery, which obviously if you guys have come to this, you will probably want to do some sort of surgery. Don't neglect the medical jobs. I've started on a medical job and I'm really, really happy that I've started on a medical job. I've got, you do your day-to-day -day ward, which is not that dissimilar from what you do on a surgical job, but with medical on calls, you have all sorts of things that you're called about low hemoglobin, desaturation, hyperkalemia, high glucose, all these things. And at the first kind of time I did it, I was like, oh my God, I have no idea what's going on. Very stressed. It's different to medical school where it's just, you know, tick like book, book work, like tick, this is done. My hyperkalemia patient, I was like, oh my God, it's a panic. It's an emergency. And my reg was like, no, we have time, relax, it's fine. And so it's nice, I think, to get into a, a position where you have a good general overview of medicine. You start at the beginning, so no one expects you to know everything. But by the end of your first medical job, you'll have a really good grounding of medicine. And that those medical skills you will use in surgery. And medicine also, I found, has had really good support systems in terms of your reg. Um, and whereas surgery sometimes doesn't have the same. I was at a met call the other day for a surgical patient and the surgical reg turns up and goes, mm, I'm not urology and leaves. And the medical registrar was the person who dealt with the patient. So sometimes having a medical job is really good just to make sure that you're getting comfortable with medicine, even though you want to end up doing surgery. So I personally think doing a medical job first or at least second is a really good idea. Starting with something like psychiatry, or something supernumerary will mean that you have quite a big jump into your second job because by that point, a lot of people expect you to know what you're doing or how a ward works. But if you've done psychiatry in the community for your first job and you're then learning the system, learning the new IT system or how referrals work in your second job, it's gonna be quite stressful. And it's not to say that you can't do it. And if every other thing is perfect in that job, do it. But I would say if you can try and do a busy medical job first or a busy surgical job first. Um, and then in terms of less busy jobs, so there's like psychiatry, GP, community jobs, which tend to be in F2 um, and there are other community jobs as well. You tend to be nine to five and that's a really good time to consider doing an exam. So MRCS, because even though it sounds like a lot <laughs> compared to medical school when it's nine to five, in medical school you're like oh i'll go in for the morning and then i go home you have so much time as a medical student having nine to five is having the most time that you will have during your f1 and f2 so it's a really really good time to start thinking about prioritizing um doing an exam specific jobs i think are less important if you're doing gastroenterology versus cardiology it's not going to make the world of difference all your patients are going to be involving referring different people uh, to different specialties uh doing ward round notes doing discharges and TTAs, it's very similar. So specific jobs aren't drastically important at all. And even from an interest perspective, like I'm on cardiology and I think I've put a stethoscope to a chest like three times in my actual day job. And I've looked at a few ECGs, but nothing, they're like the medicine of the job. As an F1, you're not there to do it. You're there to write the notes of the people who do it. So um, the specific job is really not that important. Um, unless you're really, really interested in, in one particular specialty, for example, if you're interested in TNO, then try and get that job. Um, but you might find that you will be sacrificing your location to get the specific jobs that you want. So um, at that point, it's down to you guys to prioritize what you'd prefer. Um, I think I found that I wanted to be around 30 minutes commuting from where I lived, um, which was my ideal. 
And so I would kind of sacrifice a few jobs to get that, whereas other people will be like dead set on getting T and O and therefore would be happier to travel an hour each day to do it. So it's, it's completely up to you guys. Um, DDH versus teaching hospital. You guys will also hear a lot about this. And I've heard a lot about this when we were applying what's best to do first. Um, DDH is good because you get busy jobs. So you'll get a busy medical job and you'll end up doing a lot of practical skills because there's less support from um, phlebotomists and things like that. So you end up, you end up learning a lot in a DDH, which some people say that's really good to start on because then you can ease into your teaching hospital year. But I've also think that like, if you started in a teaching hospital, you might get more exposure to things like research from early on and good mentors and then be able to look at like lean on them later on. So I think that you will be able to find benefits in doing both. And also teaching hospital, even if you're less full on with um, doing the medical on calls or like if, if you have more support, so you're less in the deep end. Some people like that as well. Some people would rather have an ease in before they get thrown into the deep end with a DDH. And obviously you can do both years in one or the other. So again, personal personal preference for that, but it, neither is better than the other. You can do just the same in, in either. Um, should you prioritize a surgical job in FY1 or FY2? So ideally FY2, because you're technically higher up in the pecking order. So if there was an opportunity to go to theater, you'll have more opportunity to go. However, it depends when you want, if you were wanting to apply for CST and when, because if you were going to apply for CST in your F2 year, you apply in October and therefore getting a surgical job as your second or third rotation in FY2, any theater time or any, you know, research you do with them isn't going to count because you will have already applied. So it depends when you're thinking of applying. So ideally the first rotation in your FY2 would be a really good time to do it. But if you're, and if you're not worried about doing CST in your FY2 year, at any point in FY2 is fine, but otherwise it doesn't really make a whole world of difference because FY1s and FY2s you'll find do almost the exact same job. FY2s can sign for control drugs. That seems to be the only difference I found so far. <laughs> but um, okay, if what if you don't get a surgical job? So I think this is really important to mention because it does not mean that you can't do CST. Um, my sister who's doing our third lecture, she came 38 out of 2000 or something in the CST applications and she had no surgical jobs at all. So she didn't just get in, she absolutely smashed that section. And she, that's, there's just other ways you can do it. So if you don't get a surgical job, it's not the end of the world. So try and get one, obviously. She had two, originally two torn orthopedic jobs, but because of COVID, she ended up not getting either because one of them was transitioned into an ITU job and the other one was during COVID. So it's the COVID rotor. So it's not, it's not the end of the world to do that. Things that you can do if you don't get a surgical job is swap placements. So you can only swap your F2 jobs. You can't swap your FY1 jobs. So when you choose your job, prioritize getting the FY1 jobs that you want because they are strict. They, they, they are the ones you're gonna have. But you'll find that some people in FY2 will be like, oh, I've got a surgical job and I don't want it. It might mean that you have to change your location to get it, but you can do it and that's absolutely fine. Um, sometimes you'll be lucky and get it in the same hospital that you're in, just someone just didn't want to do it. You can also do taster weeks in um, surgery as well to get some, build up your logbook and PDP time, which is your personal development time. You get two hours a week, which you can ask to have as a day a month. And you can, if you're proactive about it, you can spend a day in theatre for one day a month and just build up your, your how many surgeries you've done, which is what my sister did. So it's doable. It's not the end of the world if you don't get a surgical job. That would be the last bit. Cool. We're halfway through. <laughs> Okay, um, so we just put in a little slide here for the next um, half of the lecture, just um, because you can be quite proactive um, in medical school. So we've just said, what can in the meantime, this CST, we've got the link here um, for this document we keep referring to. Oh, the CST, the CST, this is it, um, the link. Now, I personally didn't actually look at this until fifth year. And um, so either you'll look at this and think, oh, good, I've ticked off loads of things. Like, look, I've been doing loads. Or you'll look and be like, oh crap, I haven't even started, I need to get going. Um, 
So we've got a list as well here um, of things that you should be considering or things that you can think about. Um, during medical school, as I said, it's never too early to start thinking about this. Um, and once you're aware of what is on this and what kind of things they look for, then when you're applying for certain like committees or whatever you're doing, get involved in research, you can be thinking in the back of your head, oh, well, if I do this, you know, I could get some points for doing that. Um, let me just move that out of the way. Um, so number one, commitment to specialty. I think that's on the next slide, is it? Or... Yeah, yeah, yes it is. Uh, um, commitment to specialty, other degrees I've talked about, um, prizes, audits, teaching, training, presentations, leadership, public. so I'll, I'm touching in on commitment, prizes, teaching, leadership, um, which are on the next few slides I think. So commitment to specialty, um, you can do this throughout, so I would say if you can, in definitely fourth or fifth year, if you if your medical school allows you to pick certain placements, so we were allowed to pick in fifth year two placements, one for eight weeks, one for four, um, and I chose trauma and orthopedics and uh, plastics on a burns unit, and um, so obviously both surgical because I was like, well, I get to choose what I do. So I would highly recommend um, doing those because you will then have so much experience to go into theatre as we said before in medical school you've got loads of time um compared to when you're working and as an f1 you're not going to get into theatre as much um unless you really try and go out of your way to get in so if you can go in now and do those um there's a slide later about how you log things and i'll show you that um oh yes here um so basically I went I think nearly every day over the eight weeks in trauma orthopedics to theatre because I just loved it like you'll know when you go if you think it's exciting and you want to go in that's when you know that like you're you're going to be a surgeon so, <laughs> and so I went every day over the eight weeks I think I got about 27 cases built up and um, so it was the ankle team I was with so it's just loads of by malleolar fractures and all these things and um, so I then got onto this website it's called the e-log book asked for advice from the f3 who was doing it as well and um, for which one was the right one so that's one that he recommended um, and then I then went to my consultant at the end of the eight weeks and he literally signed me off for all 27 and on this application involvement in 15 cases or more gives you the max points so there you are you can do it in medical school before you even start f1 f2 you can just tick that one off already and um, if you don't have that opportunity as we've said you still get points for a less number of cases and you can then go in f1 or f2 and just increase them once you get on um so the next one i think yep yeah. so i've got a little slide here um on surgical courses and conferences so i would really recommend going to conferences as many as you can during medical school because this will show your commitment to the specialty this will show that you've been thinking about it from an early age you've been thinking i want to investigate this i've really thought this career through um and if they see oh years ago she was going to these conferences and trying to you know see that that'll just really plug that you're interested in it um I, th I can't remember how many I've been to, maybe about four or five, I think I've been to um, during medical school. So yeah, just try and go to as many. Um, other things you can do are courses. Um, some you could do um, during medical school, maybe at the summer school in anatomy, potentially practical skills for medical students. So just got a list there of all the different types. There are some that are free, which we put in brackets, this National Catheter Education course. Um, because some of them, I think the basic surgical skills can be quite expensive to do. Um, so if you're not keen on paying loads of money for certain things, that's absolutely fine. You can just do the free ones. Um, and I think they only look um, for you going to two courses. That's how you get the points on the application. Um, so you can either go to two, just go to the free ones, then you're done. Or you can go to two and then just go to a couple more if you're really keen on learning um, surgical skills um, outside of your day-to-day -day job. Okay. Okay, so in terms of prizes, you can get up to eight points for prizes on the CST application. That's based on the 2021 um, guidance, which hasn't been updated for this round because they're about to apply, I think, in 
November this time. They've pushed it back slightly this year. Um, so it might change. A few things might change. Um, but it's eight points if you get a national prize. And that is the equivalent of doing two PhDs in terms of the points prizes. PhD gets you four points. A national prize gets you eight points. And there are so many different ways that you can do this. Um, so it's, it's easier said than done, but at the same time, because there are so many different ways you can do it, most people should be able to get some sort of prize. So I've just mentioned a few here. Medical school prizes. So for example, if you come top 10% in your year um, for an exam, that'll count for a local prize. If you get um, a distinction at the end of the year, that counts for somewhere between regional and national. That's like, we understand that you put a lot of effort in to do that. Um, FY1 doctors can get prizes in things like leadership or audits if you've done something pretty impressive during your year. Essay prizes, so all of the big um, the big kind of like things like RSM, Royal Society of Medicine, Royal Society of Surgery, ACIT, all of these things, they have essay prizes um, and all sorts of prizes throughout the year that they have some specifically for medical students. And so it's worthwhile looking into this while you're a medical student because they count. And if you're a medical student, you're then not competing against other junior doctors because junior doctors goes up to kind of, you know, CS, CT2 or I think, or reg, it even goes up to regis, doesn't it? So the juniors, otherwise you've got quite a lot of competition when you become a doctor. Um, I have put a link down here, which I thought I was looking into this earlier and the student medic, he, this person has a whole list with links on for different, um, for different websites that you can look at to get incentive of where you might find prizes. And I think it's worthwhile having a look at because um, it's got the kind of classics of Royal Society of Medicine, which do prizes for things like if you've done a good case report um, or an interesting case, or you've done a presentation or those kind of things, they'll all be on there. But this is a really good summary of what you can find um, prize wise. Also, it's worthwhile mentioning that if you end up doing an oral or a poster presentation at a conference, you can get a prize for being the best person there. And that counts, too. So there are so many different ways you can do this. And it's just it's eight points if you can get a national one. So a national doesn't have to mean, you know, national could be a, a small national conference and you win the poster pre presentation. You've, you've made a pro poster, you've gone to a small conference, which has defined itself as national and you've got all the points. So, and that's two PhDs guys. So it's worthwhile looking into. <laughs> um, okay. And then moving on to kind of research. So there's multiple different sections which involve research. So there's publications, there's presentations, which include posters and oral presentations. And then there's also audits as well. Um, and all three of them, you can start as a medical student. And I think it's really important to start early because even though it's quite hard to actually for it to ever kind of materialize, it's you have so much more time as a medical student. And I can't emphasize that enough, especially compared to the first two months or so of being an F1, you'll find that you have no time and no thoughts of anything other than going to work and doing okay and leaving being like, I think I made a difference, but I'm not sure. So you'll find that um, you'll find that you're so exhausted that you'll really be pleased with yourself if you started something early. Um, and so just to kind of keep you guys updated, in terms of presentations, if you do a national oral presentation, you get six points. And at the moment, um, they're doing a lot of conferences online. So you can do an oral presentation, but, but like I did one which was recorded and I sent in the recording and um, they, so I didn't even have to present it in front of a live audience. And that still counts because you get a certificate saying you presented at a national conference. And again, conferences, national conferences can be quite small because some of them would be very niche, but as long as they've got someone from the North of the country and the South of the country and somewhere else, it's national. So um, look into them while you're at medical school because it, they're not as intimidating as you think they might be. And also, a lot of things can be presented. So if you've done a mini audit at a GP or you've done an interesting case report, anything like that, you don't have to have done a report, but if you've seen something interesting, you can write it up as a presentation and it will count. In terms of publications, to get the max number of points, you have to get um, two first author publications to get full points. So this one's actually probably one of the hardest sections to get full marks on, because as like Lois was mentioning earlier, publications can take an awful long amount of time. I started one in fourth year and 
it was accepted like a month ago. So it was like three year process or something of getting to that to that stage. So and it only counts if it's public, pub, um, if it's got an ID to say that it's it's been, I can't remember what the word is, but you can get it to count if it's not on um, PubMed yet, as long as it's going to be on PubMed and they've like fully approved it and it's got a date for it to be published. So there is some leeway with it, but this is a big one to try and get. I would say whenever you've got an SSC or you're in a surgical placement, and it doesn't have to be surgery as well, like publication can be anything. If you're on a medical job and someone's just got something that's a really good, really good idea, snap it up, anything is good. Um, I'd say be serious. When you talk to your supervisor, be like, I want to get a publication right at the beginning of the time and say, and if they give offer, offer you something, don't be caught like caught up by just doing loads of data crunching and rubbish stuff if you don't have an end goal or they don't if they're not being serious about what it is you're going to get out of it so try your best to like figure out whether or not what they're offering you is actually legit or not because you don't want to spend all your time doing nothing for nothing loads for nothing um but yeah tell your supervisor at the beginning i want to get a publication how can you help me do it um and publications they can be big things like systematic reviews, but you can also do things like case reports and that counts. So if you find an interesting case that your supervisor will help you with, you just write a case report, a little bit of a literature review about it and you can just keep sending it to places until they accept it, um, which is probably an easier way to get publications. Um, and just one more little comment about clinical letters. This is more relevant for those of you who are probably applying this year or next year for those final publication points in your application for foundation year, clinical letters are really easy to get um, if, if it's not like just before foundation application time, because you basically just write a letter to an editor and say, you've re read this, in, uh, you've read this really interesting report and you want to reply to it. And you write a kind of 500 word reply with a couple of references and you can send it to places like clinical teacher is a good one to have a look into. And if they accept your letter to the editor, it then goes on PubMed. And so that is a really easy way of getting a publication for your F, like foundation application. And this also counts for things like the AFP. Um, it doesn't, I don't know if it definitely counts for later on because I think it has to be original research, but it's worthwhile like thinking about doing something quite quite low low effort um, to get max points. And this is also worthwhile doing with friends because if you all write, say four of you, like my some of my housemates did, four of them all together wrote different letters and then they put all of their names on each other's and they edited each other's and then one of the four got accepted. And so then they got a PubMed ID by doing one little essay for each other. Um, but I know, as you mentioned earlier, that I'm not sure it will 100% count anymore. Um, and then audits and quality improvement projects. This is something that you can leave until F1 because as an F1, you have to do an audit. So it's not something that you have to do as a medical student. However, if you have, for example, a GP placement at the beginning and the end of your year, you can do really, really simple audits. Like for all people who take this drug, do they actually get their LFTs tested, you know, one week and then four weeks after they're on it? You have a quick look through it during your first placement and then present what you found and then you can re-audit it in your later on GP placement and you get full marks for that because um, you've done an audit and then you've re-audited it and you've seen if there's been an improvement by what you did and so it's really easy it, it, you can do a very simple one as a medical student but I wouldn't worry too much about it because you have to do one as a F1 so that's something that if you want to leave till later you can um, and one other mention about research is it used to be that you could basically do an audit, which you then presented and then wrote up and it was published and you'd get points in all three sections, but that's no longer the case. So you now have to do three separate things um, for the section. So you can't have one piece of work counting for multiple sections. So that's worthwhile knowing about. You have to have things in multiple pies as such to get maximum points. Um, Back to you guys. Okay. Yep. So now we're just touching in on teaching. I've mentioned this before. Similar to all the um, parts of this application for CST, local, regional, national, just keep thinking those three things in your head. Um, so me personally, I, in Liverpool, where I studied, 
got on this it's called peer medics and um, committee so that was just like within the medical school helping put some teaching for them that was your local one then went there's this thing called incision uk it's kind of like global surgery um and they kind of like promote that um it was a regional rep for them so just ones just to be aware of that if you're thinking for future things to do those are good ones um and then national then i'm now on this nsts speaking to you today um so yeah so um really important to while you're in medical school apply to some committees if you haven't yet don't worry if you, if you haven't done that's fine probably have the time if you're still in medical school to do those things um even once you get to f1 you can be involved in teaching as well um really important to um be involved in designing and then implementing so if you can teach sessions please get involved and um, really good to practice this early on because it can be quite nerve-wracking to speak to a lot of people so it's good just to get practicing i'd recommend starting off even just giving local teaching to medical students if you're on placement so if you're the older one if you're the fourth or fifth year you could just give like a little lecture at lunch to um third years and they'll think that you sound so smart so <laughs> Um, would really recommend doing that just to start off, get used to it, and then you can sort of progress um, up to higher levels. Um, really important that you do this for three months or longer. Um, but if you're on a committee for a whole year, then you've automatically really done that anyway. So that's not a problem. Um, and that you have evidence of formal feedback. So make sure you just get your little feedback forms filled in after you do a teaching session um, and try and push that. Um, so yeah, that's teaching, just we'll keep it snappy. <laughs> and then leadership, very similar again, local, regional, national. Um, really important to note, doesn't have to be medical. So on the application, um, all they want is that it's for six months, you've held either local, regional or national level of leadership. But if you're in a sports team or anything, you could just just do that. You just have to be medical. So I quite like that, that is, you know, they're not pushing you just to do everything has to be medicine. Um, if you want to go for medical one a really good one to i'd recommend is a bma rep you can apply for that and um, you can do that in medical school or beyond if you are fifth year and realizing oh no I haven't done leadership um need to get involved um you can be an f1 rep um either just like for your hospital um where you kind of like go to these meetings and you talk about improvements that you want to make um and how the other f1s are feeling or you could be a national F1 where you go to like the national meetings um, with other F1s from around the country. Um, so the, the key point to hone in um, for the whole of the previous slides is that this is the time to be applying for all of these things, to be thinking about these things. Um, and the fact that you've come today and you're wanting to know about it is great because it means that you'll leave and you'll be thinking, oh yeah, I should be applying for that, or oh great, I've done all these things, I can now think about this in F1, um, and what else I want to be doing with my time, because you will have to prioritise once you start working, um, and just really choose the, the most important things, so like, just do that one audit, because it'll just get you the points in, just re-audit it, and then you don't have to do five audits, for example, so it's just knowing those things, um, so that you don't waste loads of time, you know, so you can also have a life out of side medicine as well. Okay. Um, yep, so we've just said here at the end, know the timeline, which we've covered at the start. Um, so you know how everything works and how to fit maybe revision if you've got finals and final year um, around all of your other exams that you have to do. Um, yeah, interesting. So if you've made really good um, contacts, so especially if you're on surgical placements and you meet really nice surgeons who like you, make sure you get their email address and then later on if you need things um, or something signing off or like just evidence that you've done a certain thing, then you can email them and get in contact. Um, and yes, this is really important at the end. So I I think I went through at the end of fifth year and I just tried to like download a couple of like certificates and um, but I would really recommend doing this as you go along because then you'll end up at the end of medical school oh my goodness I've done loads of things but I don't really know what I've done and I haven't got any evidence or they're all in my emails sitting somewhere beyond for <laughs> two years or more so I would get a little folder on your computer put them all in there as you go along just like your, your certificates and evidence that you've done things or just print them all out, put them in a folder, whatever's easiest for you. Um, but yeah, just keep track of everything you've done. 
so it saves you doing more later on. Yeah, I also want to just emphasize one thing that Lois said there, which I think is really important, is at, as a medical student, if you're going to do something, try and do it really well. So if you decide you want to do the teaching element of it and you want to teach nationally um, as, as a medical student for three months, you could do it, but do it properly. Like try not to waste your time doing something which is like not going to get you all the marks. You can try like, so for example, I was on a committee for OBS and Gynae at uni and we did a conference and then I advertised doing some teaching sessions to the conference, which meant that a few people from different universities turned up each time to my OBS and Gynae teaching and it made it national. And so even though I was doing the exact same teaching that I would have done for the kind of year below from a uni level because a couple of extra people turned up and I just made a comment on the feedback form what university are you from I could then have proof that someone else came from a different thing so I put a lot of effort into making sure that teaching section I had fully completed and so now I don't have to worry about it as a F1 and so while I did no audits and that's something that I've not done at all I feel like it's it's worthwhile being efficient and making sure you have the things that you've done you've done really well so Try not to do everything half-heartedly. Choose one or two things that you really want to nail as a medical student rather than, yeah, rather than trying to have too many things on at the same time. But yeah, that is the end of our lecture. We appreciate all your feedback. As you guys know, gathering feedback is super important. So <laughs> if you guys don't mind just having a look at this QR code um, and giving us some quick feedback, we'd really appreciate it. Um, I've seen some questions in the q and I'm going to see if I can get them up, but for some reason yeah, I can't. Yeah, amazing. I've been, I've been, there's been loads of questions and it's so great that so many of you have been um, super engaged. So I know that it's probably now um, about seven, but if anybody wants to hang tight to try and go through um, any of the questions that we haven't asked, while you're very kindly filling out some feedback, which is super useful for Lois and Kate giving up their busy schedules to um, come and tell you about their experience, um, it would be really great while we go through some questions. Also want to say massive thank you to Kate and Lois um, for being here and giving this lecture. Um, I'm also just going to really add that don't panic. You know, all of this is basically additional, extra, amazing things that you can do on top of already, I'm sure, smashing life as a medical student. Um, so even if you do none of the things that have been mentioned and just follow the process, you will be fine and, and you can get those jobs. We're just here to tell you tips and tricks um, and extra things basically to make your life easier. So when you're getting to your applications, you're not thinking, oh my goodness, why did I not do some of this sooner? Um, so we're just kind of mainly going from the perspective of what we wish we knew um, at medical school to make sure that we um, basically maximize the chance of getting those jobs that we really want. Um, so I'm going to ask these guys a few more questions as I can go. A lot of it, um, a lot of the questions that have come up is trying to ask how your presentations or your audits or your papers may count. I'd really recommend just going through the documentation that is online and the handbook, the guidebook, because that will be much clearer than we can probably tell you. And they have quite clear specifications as to what will help. Um, as in what will count as points um, and what won't. Um, so I, to be honest, we might not necessarily know how many points you might get for something that you've done without seeing it. Um, so I would go there as my first point of call. Um, I'm gonna next, the next question I'm gonna ask is, in terms of intercalating, do you guys have any advice whether you'd recommend doing this after third year or fourth year? Um, so I, I, I so Lois and Interclay and I had to. So that's, <laughs> sure. uh, <you> know. <laughs> I am um, I did Interclate um and I did it after my third year. Um so I did one clinical year. I was at Leeds. I'm now F3 by the way in case I didn't introduce myself. Um so I did one um clinical year and then I interclated. To be honest, I mainly did it because that's when everybody did it. Um, and I didn't want to get break up the difference between fourth and fifth year because at Leeds that's quite a process of going from fourth year into fifth year um but to be honest I don't think it matters too much it's always a bonus to intercalate and get that extra skills and extra research and enjoy yourself most importantly mm -hmm. um so I think 
do it when it feels right for you is my very vague not too helpful answer <laughs> is also a good year if you want to think about getting starting some of the research elements to it as well because um depending on what you do in your intercalated year you have the opportunity to kind of present the project that you've worked on um it doesn't necessarily mean that you'll get published or anything like that but you can often get a presentation from it um and you just you just apply like um, submit it to any any conference that's relevant and you might find that you get it also medical student conferences count so it's worthwhile like even just looking into the kind of local cardiology conference if you've done a cardiology based um thing you can still get those points from intercalation so yeah um okay another question um I am trying to find some more ones that might be useful for everybody. Um, I don't know if you guys know in terms of if you're not there to physically present your poster presentation, can it still count for points? I think all research is good research, um, but I don't know. I don't know this. It depends on the specific application process. I think they're quite different for different training. Posts. I think it counts for oral presentations because I think often if you do an oral presentation with everyone who's on the, who's named on the paper gets a certificate, but that's also conference specific. So some conferences you'll find will only give a certificate for the person who presented, but others will give it for everyone who's named. So. It's, I don't think there's one clear cut rule for that. I think if you get a certificate saying you did it, um, usually the only thing to mention on that though is it's good practice to, if you have it on your CV, you can put a presentation that you haven't done yourself, but you can, you just highlight the name of the person who presented it. It's good practice for then, you know, you're, you're doing, you're being kind of legit with everything you've got on there. But if you've got a certificate saying that your paper was presented, you can use that, that's fine. Well. Another question is, is it possible to cover all these points when you get to FY1 for publications, research and teaching? 100 percent. Like if you like you, you can start, I think you can start really late. And like, it, I think if you start at the beginning of F1, you would be able to get everything done. I think the major thing to think about then would be being efficient about it. So, for example, teaming up with someone to do it. So say, for example, you could be the F1 rep, which you is quite an informal process. So you can just you can apply to do that. You can then um, or a BMA rep, which might get you a regional position. Um, and then you could do teaching, team up with some friends from a different deanery. And then you get some of their students, some of your students together. And each of you do a couple of teaching sessions over three months. It doesn't state how often you have to teach. So even if you've only done, you know, three or four sessions over the, the three months but if two of you have teamed up from different deaneries and you've got different um students that's technically national and as long as you have someone who's you know ticked you off for it then you can you can achieve it quite easily as an f1 so i think that it's definitely definitely doable to do it as an f1 so those of you who are just becoming like you know moving into six um six like final year don't worry if you haven't started already because you definitely can still do it Absolutely, I would agree with that completely. Um, I would would research probably takes a while. Yeah, you know, that was just only one I would say. During one year, might be quite difficult, but but in terms of audits, you're all, they're almost thrown at you when you start work. Yeah, really yeah, yeah. So just one. So plug you yourself in. Yeah, yeah, you can definitely get those. Um, and in terms of extra BSCs, MSCs, integrations, if you haven't done that, or if that's not they are not required that is not it's just an, a way that you can do points so um, people think you have to go through life really quickly that's not at all the case you know you can intercalate if you have other interests it can be helpful but additionally it's it's not the be all and end all so you um also to say on that front i think that this of the cst application that was 2021 it was about 72 points um i think in total and the cutoff for getting an interview was something like 45 so you can drop a lot of points so you might you know you might not you might have got two publications and be smashing that section but haven't done a degree but that's absolutely fine because you'll meet the threshold and then after that it's all about the interview and so you know while it because it I mean it changes every year and we'll cover that more in the final lecture but if you don't have one area that's fine you can just build it up in a different area so be reassured that you don't have to have all the marks for all the sections to do well. I am, um, I think I'm going to pull it to a close there. There are so many questions and feel free to get in touch with us either via the website or um, by your feedback forms, which we will read through if you've got any other questions. And um, there are two more lectures in this series. Um, next one will be 
um, next Wednesday, which will um, be managing your foundation year. So we'll go into a lot more detail about your portfolio, things you can do as an F1 and F2 to really maximize your, um, your time as an F1 trainee while still coping and having a bit of work-life balance. Um, and then the final week will be specifically on core surgical training applications. As Kate mentioned earlier, it will be by her sister, Alice, um, who did amazingly in her training application, um, despite having never had a surgical job because of COVID. Mm -hmm. um, so um, she's going to talk us through the core training, core surgical training application process um, and how to really maximize and go into a bit of detail about exams, when to do those um, and how to get um, things sorted. So stay tuned for the rest of and come along next Wednesday and the Wednesday afterwards we'll all be here and um, so you feel free to answer any of your questions ask any more of your questions that didn't get answered today as well then if Kate or Lois have anything left to say just to say that I put my email in the group in the chat so if anyone wants to email me any questions yeah I'm so happy to do that as well um, and please fill out the feedback thank you so much everybody for attending and um thanks Jen for organizing have a lovely rest of your evening thanks girls